All right, so this is the material we're going to use for making up those machine feet. This was a counterweight off a small foil annealing furnace that was scrapped. And uh, I thought, that's going home. It's not going to get scrapped and thrown out. So uh, it's been sitting in my garden for nearly 15 years. So we're going to make use of this material. I don't know what type of material it is. I guess we'll find out when we start uh, start turning it and see how good it, uh, how well it does turn. But uh, what we've got there will do these machine feet nicely. All right, guys, let's get the uh, rod cut off, get them separated, and uh, we'll get it up in the lathe and have a look at how we're going to go about doing those. All right, guys, so these are the uh, mounting feet that we're going to make up for the Victor lathe. Um, there was a similar design to these done by Adam Booth on his Victor lathe that I found on the, uh, on the internet. So we're sort of following his footsteps a little bit, I guess. Um, I had the design all knocked up before I'd actually seen his video. I was having a bit of a look around to see how other people did them. You can get the resilient mount cushy feet that, uh, that mount up the proper machine feet, but they're fairly expensive. And uh, for what we're doing here, this is going to be absolutely fine. And I've got the material for it, so it's not going not to cost me anything. So that stock I've got is a bit of 4-inch stuff. So we'll knock that down to 100 mil. We'll do a recess up inside so that we're only just impinging on the outside diameter. Because I have that 16mm hole inside, my jacking feet also have a hole up inside. Now that's 14mm in diameter. That one up inside there, or 15mm, so it's fairly close to the size of that. What I'm going to do is put a washer down inside. So we'll counterbore in a little bit deeper. I'll put a washer inside there that those jacking screws can fit onto. Fairly nominal as far as the angle goes, 62 degrees. Other dimensions are fairly nominal as well. No great rocket science in that at all. All right, let's uh, let's make a start with the stock and we'll see how things turn out, eh? Right, uh, so I've got a good center in there now. Um, a little bit dicey machining it with the uh, with the overhang there. Now that I've got that supported, I've got a very, very fine tool that I can get in there to do the facing off. Um, don't have to go all the way up to the center here because it is going to be counterboard back to suit the uh, those jacking screws. <coughs> We get to give our new change gears a bit of a go. It's going to take about a mil and a half off the OD to see how it performs. I won't get too excited with it. like an absolute treat. And the surface finish is really nice too. Alright, I'm going to measure that and just see how parallel that's cutting. Alright, so that's at 32.5. Thirty-two point five. <laughs> that is dead nuts on. Thirty-two point five. I just said the other end. Thirty-two point five. Absolutely spot on. Now that's a bit of a problem. I'll show you what's going on here. All right, so here's a bit of a problem. As I said, I've angled my top slide, and my turning tool is actually sitting on top of the top slide. Normally, when it's in the uh, proper position with this at 90 degrees, it hangs down over the side of the top slide. So it's actually sitting up off-center. 
So I'm going to have to put one of my other turning tools in there to, uh, to get that back on the centre. Alright, we're back in action. I've put his, uh, his little brother in the, uh, in the tool post here, we're, we're back on centre. Alright guys, we've got to come 50 millimetres from the face down, that's at uh, the end of our taper, so I've just marked that off with a bit of blue and, uh, and just put a scratch on there. So that's where we're going to come back to, we'll make each one the same as we go through. That's the first taper cut. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, mark this out. I'll set it up, we'll take it out of the three jaw chuck, set it up in the bandsaw and cut. We'll put this back in again, uh, we'll reface it, put a centre back into it and uh, repeat the process. So, Alright guys, we've got that in the, uh, in the bandsaw ready to cut. Um, I've had to put a half mil shim just in the side here because the uh, the unmachined section is just catching on the jaw so i've just had to square that up a bit and we'll have to do the same underneath when that does come into play further on down just to keep that nice and square um i've got a mark here i've given myself a couple of mil of meat on that to uh, to clean up so we should be right to go okay, so this is number four this is number four for the feet um one thing I'm loving about this lathe is the power and the amount of metal that you can actually move. And now that I'm up close to the chuck, I can really take some uh, take some depth off. So let's quickly show you how that's looking at the moment. And it does it with absolute ease, so um, yeah, very, very happy with uh, with how this lathe is performing so far. It's nice to be able to get metal hogged off very, very quickly. Well. Right, guys, I'm going to machine this bottom face now and get that to length and square it up. And the way I'm doing this is that, uh, well, the way I've drawn this up and designed it is that the cone will fit and register just on the ID of the chuck with a little bit hanging out so I've got enough to grip on to think about when you are machining stuff up um, I designed this so that I could fit this up the snout and I did have enough overhang to be able to machine this this nice and flat and uh, and square to the center line so when you are designing things or machining things look at the future step setups that you want to do and try and design or look at your methodologies around work holding uh, if it leaves, means you've got to leave tangs on or, or change your diameter or, or a taper slightly that, that's not critical to make things fit a bit better. Um, think about that, it makes life a little bit easier down the track. Saddle locked in place, and I'm just licking each one off to be exactly the same height or length. Well, guys, there's our final six all to the overall envelope dimensions. Um, 
I need to do a counter bore on each of them to be able to fit the jacking bolt inside. And as I said, we're going to go a little bit deeper so that I can fit a 5mm thick washer inside there as well. And the final adjustment obviously will be done by the jacking screws. And the underside here, I'm just going to cut a, a back recess in here and we're going to have maybe, I don't know, 8 to 10 millimeters of land on there. Um, just so that we're bearing on the outside di diameter of the uh, of the um, supports. Um, that way we don't still get too much of a rocky motion. All right, I'll set up. We'll do the rear ones first, and then we'll do the counter bores back inside for the uh, for the jacking. Alright, done. That's all we need. Half an just to give it a bit of relief. All right, we'll go through the remaining five, and uh, we'll come back and do the counter bore for the checking screws. Okay, I'm counter boring up inside the feet at the moment with the diameter 20, so I'll do one after the other, machine to depth, and we'll put them back in again and do the final bore to diameter and final bore to depth in one operation. So I'll treat this a bit like a production like this. Alright, so we're doing the final bore on this one now, so I think it's at 21.5 in diameter and uh, 10 mil deep. We do that in one cut. Alright, done. I'll just put a little chamfer on that and uh, we'll do the other five. And we've finished all the turning on these feet now. Um, last thing to do is to make up the uh, the washers. All right, how good does this sound? Let's hop over to the other lathe. <laughs> so we're on the small lathe here. I'm just going to make up these uh, little washers that go inside those uh, counters. <laughs> Okay, we've got the button set up on the um, surface grinder now. I'm just going to give basically the final lick on this now, and we're, uh, we're just about done. Out over five minutes and they're all exactly the same. So uh, we've had to do that in the lathe and set them up in the in the three jaw chuck and then put the um, the uh, roller up against it. You know, I'd be probably looking at you know 15 minutes before I get them all finished. But yeah, nice and quick on the surface grinder. Very handy machine. All right, guys, there are our machine feet finished. Um, I'm happy with the way these have come out. I, I prefer a tapered profile because they are going to be sticking out from the lathe a little bit and your feet may catch them, at least it's just going to glance them off uh, rather than having something solid out there. Um, they've got a good bearing area on them, so I'm happy about that. There are our little washers that we've, uh, that we've ground up. I just want to pop those in there like that. And, uh, they're a nice fit. And then our adjusting feet go on top, so we're just sitting proud of the, the thread there. So we can get those adjusted up to suit. I was looking at how's the best way to finish these up, and I was going to blue them, but there's a fair bit of blue in that to do that. So I might just um, spray paint them in a, in a gloss black, and we'll put them in that way. But uh, all in all, not very, very happy. They've come up really, really clean, so very, very happy with that. And no mistakes for change. All right, guys, we'll see you when we're installing these, which won't be too far down the track, but I've got a bit of painting to do. We'll get that sorted out, and, uh, and we'll come back and, uh, and finish this off. Right, let's look at the final result. And here we are. So those uh, machine feet, I'm very, very happy the way they came out. So that's up the headstock end. And down the tailstock end.
I'll show you how accurate we've got this lathe to as far as level goes. Alright guys, as far as alignment goes, what I've got is I've got two of my ground tenons and I've stoned these before I put them into place to put them across the flats on the bed. And um, as you can see, we're pretty spot on there. Always with a level, you need to turn it around and do a confirmation. And always give it a sweep. And it's drifted that way by the tiniest, tiniest amount. And just to reconfirm. And sweep. Now that's the tiniest, tiniest amount. We're talking tenths of a thou there. These divisions, if you do have a, a level that you're not familiar with and you want to check the divisions, Grab yourself a piece of shim, and I know this one is one thou per division, and try and get it across the full width. Let's move that camera up a little bit. And you can see we're pretty much on the lines in that particular case. Watch my hands, I'll put a one thou shim underneath. And you'll see that moves one division. So each division on this level is one thou. So I'd say we're within a tenth or two of a thou level on the uh, on the bed. Let's go up to the headstock end and we'll have a look at where we are with that one. All right, so that's the level in place there. And, uh, you know, we're within a couple of tenths of a thou. We rotate it round. So the level is out a couple of tenths of a thou, that's lining up in the line now. When I put it the other way, it is out a little bit. Now I've adjusted this a couple of times, and it's funny, throughout even five minutes, the level will change. And if you're going to get really, really accurate, readjust each time. And uh, I might go through a process that I used to level up a level. Um, we had a tradesman who used to always throw the level before he put it back into the box after he'd used it. So you always had to go back and reset that level. So we used to get our, our machine alignments or levels as close as we could with the machine levels. They're only over a short distance, as you can see, before we got the surveyors in. Um, surveyors are very, very expensive, so you want to try and get your machine as level as you possibly can before they start minimise their time on site. And from machine to machine, we used to use the old uh, water and dye with the bottle trick. Um, if you had a long length and you know it, it might be 50 60 meters that you're doing a, a level from one machine to another and you have a set height once again you would set them relative to each other as close as you possibly could and then go and level the machine just so when the surveyors came in once again they were on site for the minimum amount of time but i'm very happy with the way that this lathe is looking what i'll do is i'll show you on the bed And once again, that's within a couple of tenths. All right, so we're on the bed here, so we did smack in between the lines here. I'll turn it round. Oh, we're slightly that way. So once again, over that length, I'm one or two tenths out. Now, in sitting at the lathe, I know in some workshops they'd like to have the lathe tilted slightly towards the headstock so the coolant would run towards the headstock and into the tray rather than off the back of the ways and often it would go onto the floor. There is uh, channels there, but on some ways it would be an absolute pain. It would tend to drip onto the floor. So 
some guys or some some shops like to have their machines tilted slightly towards the headstock as I said just for the coolant runoff all right that's it we're done now one of the things I did want to show was the new wipers that I've made up and you can see them fitted onto the tailstock there I'll show you the ones around the back And they came up as good as the ones you would purchase for this machine. Now, the material that I used for these was polyurethane. Now, this took me nearly two months to get out of China. This is 5 mil thick material. And the reason I like polyurethane is it's pretty much indestructible against hydrocarbons. Um, I'll show you the, uh, the way wipers that came off this. I'd say these are just probably Buneran rubber. Um, they've totally perished out, swollen up, and they uh, were absolutely stuffed compared to the new ones we've got in place now. What I might do is I'll unscrew one of them and uh, we'll show you and put them beside each other and you can see the difference. All right, so that's the new way wiper compared to the old one that's come off and they do have a keeper plate over the top. And the durometer on this is probably around about 50-ish, I'd say. It's, it's got a fair bit of movement, or a little bit of movement in it, so you can tend to work it around the uh, the prism ways quite well and lock it off. And uh, as you can see, when you do lock it off, it does tend to imprint in there quite nicely as well, putting that little bit of extra tension down onto the way to give that little bit of a, a better wiping action. But, um, yeah, I just laid this out with a pen and cut it out with a Stanley knife drilled the holes and um, away it went, it was, uh, it was a perfect fit up. And the uh, the other ones that work on the flat, they're quite, uh, they're quite basic. All right, I'll get back that, that uh, all back together again and we'll see you in a tick. One thing I forgot to mention is the thickness of that uh, polyurethane and uh, the sheet that I got as you can see, it's only a small sheet. It's about 300 by 250, uh, is uh, five millimeters thick. When you measured it, it was actually closer to six millimeters, but uh, it, worked out, uh, it worked out just fine. All right, guys, that just about wraps it up for the uh, for the Victor lathe now. So we've done a, um, a full refurbish on that lathe. I haven't done a full rebuild, uh, unlike my other machine, uh, that had the, the, the headstock totally rebuilt and the apron totally rebuilt. This one here, we just did a refurb. Um, changed out all the seals, set up the oiling system properly, cleaned it down, removed all the rust and got it into a condition where it's, uh, it looks like a, a, a proper machine. We put the DRO system on it, we've made up the new change gears for it, we've made up the new uh, levelling feet for it and I've done the wipers on the, uh, on the tailstock. There was one more thing that I was going to do and uh, you might have noticed when I'm filming those fans on that uh, inverter converter absolutely do my head in. Um, I did put it at the back of the machine hoping it would tend to silence it out a little bit but, uh, but they're still very annoying and they're on as soon as the machine is turned on those fans come on. So I was looking around eBay for some bimetallic switches that I could use to put in series with the fans and those bimetallic switches would be a normally open unit and they would, they would uh, then close off at a set temperature and, and bring the fans on. So uh, I've got those little these little units here, and these ones come on and off at about 45 degrees, which I thought was a fairly reasonable temperature. When I am running this uh, this inverter converter, um, even all day long, I still don't feel any heat at all in those uh, in those cooling fins. And I was having a look around the net to see if anything else was fairly similar, if anyone else had done something similar. And guess what? Someone's already stolen my thunder on the video I was going to do, and that's Mark Presley. Uh, he's already done one on his high wing um, uh, inverters and I've got high wing on this machine at the back here 
and uh, I don't have any issues with the fans on those. As a matter of fact, I've never ever had the fans come on, but uh, on his particular model they do, and uh, they were obviously annoying him as well. And guess what? He came up with exactly the same solution. So I was going to do a video on it, but I'm going to leave a link down in the description to Mark's uh, video for silencing those fans. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I thought I had another one in the bag, but uh, I'll have to drop it. All right, guys. Um, Got some other projects in the wind, so we'll catch up with you very soon on those and uh, we'll get something on the go. Alright guys, see you soon.